Good morning and welcome to I Teach Live. This is our daily uh, time when we're uh, talk to educators and administrators around the nation about the teaching profession in general, but also specifically about in the classroom, COVID-19, all sorts of things that are impacting the classrooms and, and the education landscape. This morning, I have Niall from New Orleans joining with me. Good morning, Niall. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing well, and you? Uh, doing well, hanging in there. Obviously, this is kind of a crazy time, uh, yes. but trying to find uh, a normal, uh, you know, after nine weeks, I, I hope I found it by now. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you're doing well and healthy? Yes, we're doing well in yeah. our house. My two children, my husband and my parents, we will have all been inside. You know, that's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I think it has, um, since my maternity leave, I have not spent this much uninterrupted time with my children. And yeah. I'm sure a lot of mothers and fathers <laughs> Um, hear that testament and know it like it's completely uninterrupted time. Um, it's left though to some really positives a lot of time for self discovery or getting into that thing that you thought you never had time for now the time is uninterrupted. Sure. So I hope people are coming through quarantine and leaving quarantine in a better place than when they entered. You know, that's a good mindset to have. I think oftentimes I know for me, there's a the temptation to kind of be down, uh, but and not see that for the first time in my adult life, I've been given 40 additional hours with my two kids. And so trying to make the most of that before I, I settle back into the normal of being away from them for so long. Right. Uh, so I want to, we kind of hopped right in that conversation. Let's back out a little bit. And I want to hear about how you got into teaching. What was your background? And then how did you decide the teaching profession? So um, my first job working with kids was in the ninth grade someone had referred me to a babysitting job but it was not in the home an agency in the community needed child care mothers and fathers were going to parenting classes and needed child care and through the great run and through church someone had recommended me so that was 2003 and i've never left serving children and families since then <laughs> So it has 2003 till now is like 17 years of working with children and parents and families. More specifically, my experience in the classroom, being a teacher of records, started um, in New York City. I'm originally from New York. I worked in after school programs. I worked in children's museums. Um, I worked for Canva, which is located in Brooklyn. I worked for New York Hall of Science in their preschool department and eventually once I started my master's degree, I worked for a company called Citizen Schools, and that put me in a middle school environment on a full-time basis during the school hours of the day and into the extended day time. And then I left um, and came down to New Orleans and started being a teacher of record in 2000 and for the 2013-2014 school year. And so you've been teaching for the past seven years in New Orleans, correct? Yes, correct. Now, have you been teaching the same subject and grade level this seven years, or what's been the uh, kind of evolution of that? So I started in, with second grade. Um, I love second grade. I did three years in second, and I was really, really good. And my good work did not go unnoticed because my principal promptly promoted me to fourth grade. <laughs> and uh, a little bit of a heartbreak there because I was, um, there's so much pressure on kids and on teachers and schools and communities for that letter grade to look right. Yeah. And I knew I was playing an integral part on getting that letter grade right for the community. Um, but also, you know, my kids depended on me, parents depended on me to do my job to the full extent. So um, I had a successful first year in fourth grade and I continued in fourth grade for additional two years. And now my seventh year has been with sixth grade. So I've taught ELA, social studies, um, math, at the lower levels and then more primarily have focused on ELA and social studies in upper elementary and middle. Well, that's quite a, a journey and it seems like there's been some, some pretty significant shifts. I know second grade to fourth grade is a, a non-testing year to a testing year, which probably yeah. presents its own challenges uh, to Definitely. your stress and pressure you have on you. Yes. Um, I think what, at first when I started fourth grade, I remember getting to that first nine weeks, that first report, for court, court card and I was like oh, I don't think I like this um, I didn't feel I don't want to say comfortable but that same success that I got 
that more it what it had become that instant gratification because I know exactly what I was doing. I saw ex results more immediately because I had perfected a lot of things in second grade, a lot of teaching styles. So what that required of me was to develop myself professionally. I was on teacher tube. I was looking at best practices. I went back to scholarly journals just to see what I can do. I watched teachers in my building that were excellent in the upper elementary and ELA. And then I kind of learned what skills could be transformed from second to fourth, what skills I had to leave in second and what new skills I had to develop as a fourth grade teacher. Man, what a what a lot to to take on in just a one year transition. And and before we dive into some of the questions I have, I just want to remind whoever's watching this audience uh, this video now and then in the future that some of the things that we're going to talk about, I might not explicitly ask what's your advice on things, but I hope the audience can take away from your personal experience things that that they might be able to employ uh, in their own classroom or in their own mindset as they they tackle the teaching profession. I definitely will ask you some pointed questions about advice, but if anyone's watching this live, uh, you can certainly ask any questions that you have of Niall uh, in the comment section. We'll do our best to, to have uh, Niall do a pop quiz and uh, just surprise <laughs> her with some questions if, if you have those. Sure. <laughs> uh, so going from what you just said, you spoke a little bit about professional development. Yeah. Was this something that was um, self-imposed or was this put upon you? How did you get into prioritizing and, and looking into professional development? Um, my school, I worked for a traditional public school system here in Louisiana, and there are always CLUs that you do to keep up with your certification. So my district offered professional development. But here's the thing, I think most teachers feel the sediment that professional development is not tailored to you. Because if it's tailored to you, then you're on an improvement plan and then that's not what you want, right? So that's the right. stigma. But you should, and I think teachers should, and administration should allow teachers to have more ownership over their development. That it becomes more personal, more differentiated, and then you see teachers striving to fill their own gaps. I've been the teacher to sit in a professional development session that did not address not one need mm. that, I, that I had, and that was time wasted. So I think it's a fair balance between having a supportive administrator that allows you to go out and kind of explore and say, hey, I need development in this area. Can that be job embedded through PLCs? Do I have to travel off campus or can we bring somebody in campus if this is a trend across our campus? So, but, um, yes. Well, that's also that you're proactive because it sounds like when you, when you are having those discussions with administrators, you're looking at not just yourself, but how does it really cultivate uh, if there's a, a need across different domains or teachers bringing in a source to, to help out multiple teachers at the same time, uh, yeah. which, which is certainly helpful. And for the teachers that you're working with that might not have um, that uh, self uh, propulsion to go get that, you're helping them out too, um, yeah. to, to bring that to them. What do, you, what do you take away from PD or what do you look for uh, when, you, when you're looking at professional development? How do you measure what will be helpful or how it is helping in the class. I hope that makes sense. But yeah. How do we, how do we, I think we're, we're looking at effective lists, right? Like how yeah. do we not make sure that like, how do we make just the way we want to maximize instructional minutes for kids? How do we maximize instructional minutes as adult learners? Right. Um, I went and got my master's in curriculum and instruction because I have a true desire to develop um, efficacy for teachers and the capacity for learners in whatever school building I serve. So what I've learned from my studies and from being on the job is that, of course, there's no foolproof way of knowing, right? Sometimes we are going to think this is going to, like, I really have this need. It looks like it has the right title. It looks like, you know, these pieces are coming together and then we may end up in a situation where we don't find it to be as quality. Um, what I think was is important um, is that we try to find it to be of quality. We make sure that like these are approved vendors through our state or through our district, our parish, whatever um, our school district or our larger entity is that this is an approved vendor. But we do our own research. We have to be critical consumers of what we take in as adult mm -hmm. learners. So that may take a little bit of background and a little bit of research from us. A little bit of a headache, I uh, get it, because we are doing so many, we're doing 50, 11 things. As teachers, we wear so many hats, but I think we shouldn't sacrifice all those hats for our growth and development because quality professional development leads to higher student achievement. And if you're about that, you'll do the 
steps or you know do what needs to be done to make sure that you are your best self in front of kids in the professional aspect i think schools um can employ leadership teams and teacher leaders on campus as well to bear a little bit of that brunt i was on a leadership team um on my campus before not as an official school leader different from an administration team but i would i was selected with a bunch of other teachers to look for trends to look at data to develop some plans around improving instruction um participating in walkthroughs and what that does it kind of gives you that um, you're in that position where you can look over data at a large scale so you can look at trends large scale so then when you pick a vendor or someone to come in for professional development you know you're not just filling the gap in the ela department or the humanities or science but you're looking at your school whole school and that was an interesting experience yeah it sounds like one and it's there's a balance from the generalized pd to the specific methodology P, uh, pd as well and so trying to to maximize like you said your your hours that are being um, used for for pd is certainly crucial to balance both what's generally helpful for me as a teacher and for our school, but it's also what's specifically helpful in my sixth grade ELA class that, that I might be wanting to, to strengthen. You mentioned the team leadership and the idea around like a school support system amongst teachers uh, is, is crucial for any individual teacher. Do you rely on, on other teachers around you to help with PD vetting or recommendations? How does that work? Absolutely. I think a more knowledgeable school community makes a world of difference. I think ex experience is, is paramount. And I think having quality information and disseminating that to your staff is also paramount. So when looking for PD opportunities, of course you, because it's two ways, right? You could be looking at linear progression. So how would this affect all the teachers in my content that teach these standards that progress? Right. And then what we do as a team at sixth grade, maybe looking at culture, PBIS, and how we respond as a culture, cultural unit, different from how we respond academically. So definitely tapping into your more seasoned teachers and less seasoned teachers mm -hmm. to get a more full and comprehensive approach and PD. Now, granted, every, every PD is not gonna be for everybody. And I think though that is the strength and moving to a more differentiated model for professional development or tiering teachers. So then you can set up expectations for growth, especially as teachers coming in or as teachers reach back and mentor teachers that are coming in. Then there's, a, it doesn't have to be so strict. It can be fluid, but that there's something there. Cause I think there are, um, there are three types of schools in terms of staff. You have staff that's very well developed and you could have a whole staff like that. You can have teachers that are new coming in the door, especially with a lot of fellowships. The training is training, but it is limited because you don't have the experience. It's not balanced back out with seasoned teachers. And then you have teachers that are in a mix where their school has new teachers, younger teachers, and teachers working either to administration or teachers that are very solid in their field, even with new PD coming in, they continue to use that new PD to grow. So in those situations, you can have all of that job embedded professional development. You can have teachers right. stepping up to be leaders and coaching teachers, peer coaching, mentored coaching as, you know, many different coaching models as they exist. Yeah, that, that's a great answer. I, I do have a question about like first year teachers. You, you're now, I would call a veteran teacher. You've, you've been in different schools and grades and uh, we talk about the support system. If, if a new teacher is hired this summer, they start August, 1st of September as their first day of school. How do they get plugged into that support system and, and start learning what PD, I mean, the first year there's, there's a lot of overwhelmingness for yeah. sure. Absolutely. So how do, how do they get into that support system? Is it just going to a teacher and asking or what's your advice to, to, for a, a new teacher to be developed in that way? Um, just thinking about reflecting on my own experience, I think the key is developing the relationship before that first day of school. There's no, because there are just certain things, as we all know as teachers, the first day of school is not even about academics. So that teacher is more establishing culture and norms for kids. It's not about academic excellence on day one. 
we know that in, in functionality, that's not how we start. That's our, yeah. that's our big overarching goal, but we don't start day one in the space of academic excellence. And therefore that teacher, that new teacher is not herself starting or himself starting day one in academic excellence. There has to be a community and connections made in terms of relationship, professional relationships before that teacher walks in the building. Mm. Um, when my experience in working, I came into um, a classroom or into a school rather, I was hired on half the year. Um, which is probably a very, it's a very challenging thing for most teachers. It's challenging to start at the beginning. And I think even more so to start half the way. Absolutely. Because yeah. kids are, I'm now transitioning a teacher. I may be alarmed about that. I may be happy about that. It's a new phase. So now we got to get to know each other all over again. I got to go through this all the way again. And I think um, many schools are in that space where there's instability and staffing. Right. So what I did, I went the week before, two weeks before, and on top of that, I was hired the week before Christmas break. So <laughs> this was one week in with the kids, two weeks out, and then we're back. What I did as I went into the classroom to observe the week before, I spent time at that school. And I know everybody cannot be afforded that opportunity, but I think that made all the difference and how I was able to conduct myself, reach kids, and mesh in with the culture that already existed. I stayed about four or five days at the school mm. from, I came, initially I came from the beginning of the day to the end, and then sometimes I would drop in for just the middle of the day because I sure. wanted to see the functions and the processes that are already at work and see where the gaps were and what I can fill and see what works and needs to stay working. That made all of the difference for me, because kids now had already seen my face, even though I was quiet, I didn't talk to them. I just sat in the back of the room. I let the teacher know I'm not here to observe you. I'm here to just look at things as they are. Yeah. So I was able to kind of get those creative juices flowing and the instructional juices flowing before I came into the room. And that made all the difference for me. So I won I'm wondering if Hiring processes need to be shifted to give te teachers the opportunity to see kids in their natural space, to see the school as they function before just coming in on August 1 or September 1. Um, I know it made a difference for me for just the week that I had, what I was able to do in that classroom, but I do wonder whole scale, do we need to invite potential teachers or teachers in not just for a sample teach but like come spend a day and just see just see what it is because they're gonna be themselves <laughs> they're not right. i find more times than not they're not like oh we have company they're like oh <laughs> we have company yeah. you know what i mean so i think all of that is um i think i'm wondering if that's a shift that would make a difference for teachers especially those year one teachers yeah that's a really interesting idea but what i think i, I take away from that answer uh from you is that we have a lot of teachers that go through our program that might not be hired um, first day of school. Um, and so to see the silver lining that actually you led to almost a benefit to you and, and, and you kind of thinking about changing even broader is the idea of maximizing that opportunity to be in the classroom. So uh, if able, I, I would extend the, the encouragement to any new teacher hired after day one to get in that classroom uh, before they take ownership because uh, I think that's a great opportunity that you maximize that uh, you weren't a stranger day one, they've seen your face, but also you've seen into their rhythms and their routines and some of their personalities. You had, you had some insight to that, which I, I would think gave you a jump start amidst, a, you know, starting mid year, which is challenging. Mm -hmm. you, you took advantage of the opportunity you had to kind of jump start, hopefully the relational aspect of teaching. Yes. Yeah. Speak, speaking of the relational aspect of teaching, I want to talk about, I know that we we put a, a huge priority on year over year learning that mm -hmm. a, a student should learn one year's worth of material in a classroom for two semesters. But but I know you feel that that growth is beyond academics. And you even mentioned it a little bit that uh, day one is not about academics and, and it's about understanding students, building relationships. But talk to me about why that's important. Why is the non academic portion of the of the the classroom really important? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, school checks off so many other boxes besides academia. If you think about your relationship with school, their relationship with teachers, 
the things that stand out for you the most, I, there are some instructional experiences that I'm like, yes, I would love to recreate that for kids. Mm. But I know that that stands out because I had a good relationship with my teacher. And I don't mean that I was always well behaved. I meant my teacher knew me. My teacher cared about me more past this test score or past what I was able to produce in class today. My teacher and I had a relationship and I'm still in relationship with my second grade, third grade, my ninth and 12th grade history teacher. These are people I talk to regularly and I'm 31 years old. So why shouldn't every kid have that same experience that there is somebody at that school that cared about me past what I was able to produce? That's important because as you look at school culture and you look at relationships like between staff, between principal and admin, all of that is modeling for kids. All of that trickles down. All of that creates school culture. Right. And then how could you honestly be inspired by or be led by someone you're not in relationship with? And more, more specifically in a positive relationship with. It's very difficult to work for that boss that you know you feel in your heart doesn't like you or you just can't mesh with them and know you're not going to mesh with everyone but i think it's more important that we create these experiences for children as because they're kids where as they grow and become adults that's different we know what it is to be an adult we know it's not always easy but i think this should be some of the most best times in their life because we know adulthood is difficult so we need to create and be purposeful about creating experiences with kids that are in a positive trend for them and that i'm not saying don't discipline yes discipline yes keep cultural keep boundaries intact right, you must right. without order there's not too much we can do but we can also be intentional about creating positive experiences and positive relationships with kids. I, I uh, 100% agree and I appreciate that perspective. I also think about more broad, there's a lot of things that, that come from those good relationships and we could talk mm -hmm. a long time about those. One of the things that jumps out to me is, as a potential benefit is um, just you and your, your other teachers uh, in that when you're building positive relationships with your students, you're also helping other teachers. And I'm thinking about the next year's teacher. So you teach mm -hmm. sixth grade, by you establishing a relationship and, and from that you have inspiration for learning and, and hopefully a cultivation to be excited about learning and, and wanting to um, please you or, or impress you. Those relationships cultivate this, uh, hopefully a pursuit of excellence within the student. Now you're helping the seventh grade teacher that gets that, that student next year because you've set the expectation that you're gonna be a relational teacher that has high expectations of the students. And, and so if we think about more broadly, this trickles down from kindergarten to your class in sixth grade. If, if one of your students had teachers similar to you from kindergarten, then hopefully the hope is when they get to you, parents are on board. Students have the expectation that you think they will exceed, uh, excel in the classroom. And what, a, what a, a, a paradigm shift of education that would be if yeah. you had five previous years of teaching that set those individuals up to have high expectations of you in the classroom. Yes, absolutely. Um, I've heard someone say you put your strong teachers down low so that your teachers as they move through school don't have to work as hard. Mm. And I hear that and I'm like, yes, I see that. Because if, if that kid has excellent teaching, more so what you're saying, if we can make sure that teachers are excellent, and no, we know that they're not going to be excellent in their first year, but that there's a pathway to excellence and we know what excellence looks like. Then kids are, the, the, it's unlimited opportunities because I can put you in a situation or I put you in a school, I put you in an environment that excellence is promoted constantly. So right. you begin to know that this is your only option or I can push you for this and it's not seen as something like, that's too hard. And sometimes it is hard, but it's not too hard because you get there. And I think that's what many programs are trying to do. But I do think it's hard because what is, people have so much to say about what is good teaching? What is great teaching? What is the difference? Is it a fellowship? Is it a certain set of teacher tools? Is it Doug Lamov? Is it Uncommon Schools? Is it, is it what is it? You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I think that is, Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't, I think our, our field is unique in that way. We know that um, 
as if we were talking about the medical profession, we wouldn't be having this conversation about what's a great doctor. We, right. we wouldn't have a conversation about how to do, um, how to treat cardiac arrest because there is a standard, the standard works every time. It's, you know what I'm saying? It's 99.9% right. .9 effective. Right. Teaching is not like that. Teach, I could do so, there are so many pathways to get to success when it comes to teaching that I think it, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. It leaves the doors open to try a myriad of things, but then it's through trial and error that we figure out what is really the best right. practice and what isn't. And at the end of the day, we're trying on people's children. And that is a bit, it's alarming. Yeah. Nobody wants to, you know what I mean? Even as myself, as a first year teacher, if I had to pick, do I pick the, put my child in the class with the first year or the seventh year, I'm inclined to pick the seventh year because they've been more progressive, but we were all first year teachers. Right. So we all have to kind of go through that. We're in the trenches with the kids, with parents, with curriculum, with ourselves. We all have to go through that part, but it is at the expense of children. So we are in that like unique space that I think we can be very purposeful in saying and directing and developing the conversation around good teaching and great teaching. And I think we also have to make sure that we kind of nail it to the floor in a way because we can't take on, we, we, we are responsible whether they do good, bad, or in the middle, we are responsible as the educator. Um, there are things we cannot control, as we all know, but we're, so we're responsible for the time that we have them. So that time has to be the best time. Yeah, I, I uh, agree. And, and one of the things you said definitely resonates with me about first year to seventh year teacher. There's, there's definitely a, a craft and an art and experience that's cultivated over seven years. That's mm -hmm. absolutely true, which highlights your point of relationship building and relationship caring from day one of the new teacher. So someone going in, and this is their first year teaching, they might not be able to craft the coolest lesson that resonates the quickest with every student. But what they can do is they can create a culture in which they uh, appreciate and celebrate learning in general, because that's what's the, the foundation going forward for any other year that these individuals have better teachers or more veteran teachers. It's establishing from the get go that there's a confidence in the student to learn, that they believe in the student. And that can be conveyed by any year teacher. Uh, yeah. And then you can get to the art and the, the cool lessons or the, the routine and rhythm of teaching that, be, that, that, that can be perfected over an entire career. But from day one, you can walk in with an attitude that you have confidence in the student and your expectations are high for those students every day. And I think new teachers can do that from the beginning yeah. uh, as, they, as they cultivate all these other things you're talking about with PD and support systems and, and just experience. Uh, there's some things that new teachers can do, and, and we, we really should expect them to do. I agree. So we're running out uh, on time. I look down at my, uh, our clock here, and it, and it seems like uh, we have about a, a minute left. So with that one minute, what I want to talk about or ask you to, to close us is what's the best advice, looking back over seven years, that you can give a teacher, not just necessarily a first-year teacher, but, mm -hmm. but even like a third-year or fourth-year teacher. If someone's watching this and they've, uh, they're coming into their fourth year teaching in the fall. What, what's just a great advice that you've been given or that you can bestow on another teacher coming into a new school year? Okay. I think first, know that teaching is not for the weak. It is only for the strong. You have to be strong to do this job. You have to be, have a strong mind, a strong heart. You have to be strong. And if you've made it, for those teachers that have made it to year three and four, you are strong and you're going to get stronger. The way to get stronger is to know that thief is the comparison of joy. Your trial, your time, your career in the classroom is yours. Own it. Mm. Own your professional development. Own your personal development. Own your relationships with kids, with colleagues, with staff. Um, it's in that ownership that you will see yourself grow leaps and bounds. Be intentional about what you do. Be purposeful what you do as it pertains to this craft. And probably most of all, be reflective. Um, the growth is not going to come in, think I've gone to a PD and you got it implemented and then come back and say, was it implemented well? Invite um, 
I, I've been a proponent, have people come observe you, not for the sense of, of it being evaluative, but have people come sit down and say, okay, these are the things I'm working on. Can you look to see if I'm doing it? Record yourself and watch your staff, watch other teachers that you know that are good or that you look at and you say, I, I like this about them. Ask if you can go in. Um, um, teachers beg, borrow, and steal. It's just what we do. Yeah. We see goodness, we see g greatness and goodness in teaching and we come in and we, we want to mirror that. So imagine if we were all in that mindset and we all mirrored each other, the kids, mm -hmm. unlimited opportunity for kids. So know that you're strong, continue to be strong, own your learning as an adult. And most of all, you got to love the kids. You got to love what you do. As much as we're growing and this is a professional craft, our craft is a human craft. You have to love those kids. You got to love on them. You got to work with those parents, even though they, yeah. you're like, sometimes you're like, ooh, that was hard. Tagging a teammate. Tag somebody in. Yes, it's difficult um, at times, but the joy that I have entering year eight into teaching is like nothing else. It's, this is the very best thing that I do besides being a mother. It is, it is my heart song. It is what I do. It is who I am. And if you feel that call over you in academically or professionally, pursue it and pursue it in a way that honors yourself and keeps you in integrity. Now, those are, uh, I mean, wise, wise words. Thank you for sharing those with me personally. Thank you for sharing them for our audience. And I don't, I can't think of a, a better way to end the conversation than, than those words of encouragement. If, if I, uh, if no one's told you recently, let me tell you, you sound like a, a great teacher and I'm thankful that you're in the classroom with those kids, uh, taking a passion for kids learning and, and, and doing the hard work every day and most nights uh, yes. to, to, to impact student learning. I, I, I am confident your students will look back and, and be appreciative of that hard work. So thank you very much. Thank you for taking time out of your Monday morning uh, to talk with me. And, and I wish you the best as, as uh, New Orleans and, and the nation tries to, to get back to normalcy, uh, continue to stay healthy. Yes, thank you. Same to you, Andrew. It's great talking to you. We're Absolutely. happy to come back anytime. Sounds good. All right, stay healthy.